hope everybody is in the right place. This is session 11D. Where does deep infiltration make sense in the Northwest? This is Tuesday, September 13th. Um, our first step speakers is Catherine Thomason with Old Castle. Catherine holds a BA in chemical engineering from Oregon State University and has worked in both the stormwater manufacturing industry and private civil consulting. She has over 15 years experience in stormwater treatment design, including infiltration, detection, rainwater harvesting, and regional wastewater storm management. Catherine. Thank you so much. All yours. <laughs> Thanks for the intro, I appreciate it. Okay, where does deep infiltration make sense in the Northwest? But first, a story about water. Uh, I'm pretty passionate about water. If you know me at all, I really love storm water especially. And um, my kids have this awesome privilege of getting, me, getting to experience me talking about water like all the time. Um, so we went to Yellowstone this summer, and I mean, what better way to experience water than to see it shooting out of geysers, right? Pretty awesome. Um, my kids loved it. My son called it Star Wars Land. Um, my kids made up this amazing story of an orange dragon that brewed mac and cheese uh, down under the ground. And if you've been to Yellowstone, some of the geysers have like an orange, um, I think it's like the bacterial mats. I'm not, not an expert on this, but uh, look like bright orange flowing away from the geysers. And they thought that was like cheese sauce, right? For the mac and cheese. So it was super fun. It was great. Other days we sat and waited for geysers to go off, right? Not everyone's favorite thing in the world, but I think they're taking a little bit of my passion of water with them. And so um, more on this later, we're gonna dive into something far more interesting, deep infiltration. Um, and let's just talk about a couple things. Hopefully at the end of this presentation, you walk away knowing, right? It's always good to know what you're gonna learn at the beginning. Okay, so first, obviously, let's figure out where deep infiltration is a preferred solution. I am going to focus primarily on Western Oregon and Washington. So disclaimer up front there on geology. And then, you know, we're gonna talk about what are the benefits of reducing stormwater volume? Uh, with deep infiltration and what construction methods are used and how can these be installed quickly? Um, okay, there will be a quiz at the end. No, just kidding. Okay, so let's just dive right into some geology. My disclaimer here is I am not a geologist. Um, so grain of salt here, but we're just gonna take a little sampling and just in talk briefly about this. Okay, who here has heard of the Missoula floods? Great. Uh, these, you know, had a huge impact on especially Northwest Oregon geology. Just as a recap, Missoula floods happened around 12,000, 15,000 years ago. Um, huge ice dam, right, blocking the Clark Fork River. And that ice dam would fail, resulting in these floods through Montana, Eastern Washington, through the gorge, out to the ocean. How many times do they estimate that the Missoula floods happened? Oh, come on, just at least someone guess here. Five, okay, two, any other guesses? 80, I love this. Anything else? One, okay, great. Uh, they estimate the Missoula floods happened between 40 and 60 times. So it wasn't just a couple times, it was, you know, a fair number. I mean, obviously it's a 3000 year period here, but, um, but it happened a few times. So, you can imagine this picture here is, if you're familiar with the gorge um, in Oregon, that is Crown Point. And during the Missoula floods, they estimate that the water level in the gorge here around there was 700 feet deep, right? In the Portland area, 500 feet deep. So we're talking about some serious velocities and a lot of movement of sediment, right? We're not, we're not just talking like fine silts moving through here, we're talking about boulders moving. So a lot of movement of material. Um, that was transported. <clears throat> okay, I know this is a rainbow right here. Just focus with me here on 
green, dark green, and a brownish orange color there. Those are primarily Missoula flood deposits. Um, background here, this is Portland area. If you see the, the dark blue line, I had this amazing pointer with a laser pointer, but it wasn't reaching. So I'm sorry, I don't have a laser pointer. Um, but the dark blue line is the Willamette River. So east side of Portland, that's where you primarily see those Missoula flood deposits, right? West side of the river, a lot of basalt, a lot of steep slopes, not usually very conducive for deep infiltration. But on the east side, that's where oftentimes um, you can hit those Missoula flood deposits. Here is a snapshot from Oregon DEQ's registered dry wells. What do we see here? Uh, not surprisingly, where are dry wells located? On the east side of the river, right? There's the river, there's the east side. That's where the Missoula flood deposits are. You know, you've got plenty in Gresham. Um, there's some in Lake Oswego. You know, there's, there's obviously lots of areas that have um, these, these deposits and, and can be good, but east side is where we ultimately see a lot of dry wells. Dry wells are not new. Um, let's talk a little bit about Washington here. So this is kind of Seattle area moving down to Olympia. That picture there is the Puget Lobe ice sheet, which was one of the last large glaciers that um, came down all the way to the Olympia area. And we're talking about a glacier that's like 2,000, 3,000 feet thick, right? Huge glacier. Um, and these glaciers would advance and they would retreat, right? And as they're advancing and retreating, they're depositing different things. Um, and you know, that, that made a, a huge difference in the Seattle surrounding area geology. Another rainbow chart, hang with me here. Okay, so purple, that's till, typically not great for infiltration, right? There's a lot of purple on that graph. This is kind of Seattle metro area. Um, but blue, that is the advanced outwash deposit. So that is the glacier is advancing, it's depositing what, you know, is often this well-sorted sand and gravel. Um, those can be great for deep infiltration. And then as the glacier was retreating, it deposited those or orange deposits, the recessional outwash deposits. Um, and those can also be good for infiltration, but they're typically shallower. So we're not talking great for deep infiltration. But one thing to note here, there's a lot of purple on this um, map. And in the higher elevations, what you find is that beneath that till layer is that advanced outwash deposit, um, which is great for deep infiltration. So if you can get through that till layer, you have the opportunity um, in some of these areas with deeper groundwater to, to infiltrate. Okay, let's just walk through a few Washington drywall regs. Um, the easiest path for drywalls is if they're not considered deep. However, ecology, the word deep doesn't really have a lot to do with the actual depth of the drywall. It has everything to do with um, not hitting a confining soil later in the Vados zone, okay? So that's the key here. And it's all about getting your geotech involved, right? Hiring a geotech, having them do the site analysis, um, looking at boring logs of nearby wells to give you an idea if this might even be a possibility on your site and then working specifically with the geologist to do those deeper borings to figure out if this is a good solution. Um, also, Washington obviously has a great state database of groundwater protection areas. Um, that's obviously a huge factor in where we're infiltrating, right, is outside of those areas. So that's another thing just to keep in mind um, as you're looking at this as a solution. Um, <clears throat> Ecology also has a great graph that kind of represents what type of treatment you need upstream of dry wells. And it has everything to do with, so the, the column there on the far left is pollutant loading. That's from your site, right? So picture, you know, a residential subdivision versus a 7-Eleven parking lot, right? Like uh, the type of site is going to have different varying pollutant loadings. And then along um, the horizontal axis there is treatment capacity of your soil. So let's just look quickly here, pretend like you have a site with medium pollutant loading and the treatment capacity of your soil is somewhere ranging between zero and medium. Um, ecology says you need to remove solids and that little subscript C means basic treatment. 
So you need basic treatment upstream of your dry well um, to meet the requirements for treatment. Okay. Um, as you guys probably know, you know, using um, WWHM, you can model dry wells and um, the, um, you know, you need to keep in mind drawdown time, obviously the separation distance between groundwater and, you know, making sure that these are not built on, on steep slopes. But dry wells are not new, right? Washington Ecology has over 45,000 dry wells that are registered. Oregon DEQ has over 40,000 dry wells registered. Um, but going deeper is a bit new. So let's talk specifically about deep infiltration. <clears throat> what, what role does infiltration play? Well, there's a lot of benefits that can be had um, as a flood control measure, preventing downstream erosion, and then also, you know, just trying to get back to that pre-development hydrology of getting that water into the ground. Um, this has also been a technique used for MS4s that have, um, you know, that are almost at capacity and need to alleviate some of that strain on their system, being able to infiltrate it and not add additional pipe networks um, can be an advantage as well. Specifically with a dry well, being able to bypass that upper confining layer that we talked about uh, can be a huge advantage to getting into some of those deposits that are really great for deep infiltration. Also, they obviously have a very small footprint um, and can be used in retrofit situations. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, uh, any uh, scuba divers in the room? Yes. Okay, so usually when I talk about this, the scuba divers are like, yes, because um, pressure increases linearly with depth. And if you experience that, personally, right, going down deep into water, you really understand what that means, but it really has a huge effect on infiltration. Um, if, you know, if you have 69 feet of depth, say on a dry well, you have 30 PSI pressing down. So that really can have an impact on increasing the infiltration and reducing the number of dry wells that you need. Okay, so let's talk about some deep infiltration strategies. Uh, there's a lot of different dry well types, right? I mean, I'm sure you all see this in your daily designs. Um, the upper uh, graphic there shows city of Portland's kind of standard said manhole and then dry well combo. Um, you know, these can be very simple as in, you know, a borehole with just filled with gravel. Um, but oftentimes they're not easily maintained and they don't have a, a pre-settling component built in. So, um, Old Castle purchased a company called Torrent Resources back in 2019. Torrent is a licensed contractor and really started as a drilling company back in the 70s. Um, and they work at, worked primarily in Arizona and Southern California, but this is where we are starting to look at where this makes sense in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but they are a licensed contractor in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and kind of surrounding states and have installed more than 100,000 dry wells. Um, so they came up with a technology called the Maxwell. And it's called the Maxwell 4 because it's been through like four iterations of changes to get to the point it is now. Um, but what sets it apart is that upper 15 feet where you see kind of that orange manhole section offers pre-settling. So the water is coming in either through a grate, like you see there, or through an inlet pipe. And it actually has to spend some time, there's some residence time there, uh, where it needs to settle out in that manhole section before it fills up. Um, there's a hydrocarbon pillow shown there in orange. And then it has to go under a screen, or sorry, under a floatable baffle and through a screen to get to the pipe that then directs it down um, into the clean washed rock layer below. Um, the thing I don't love about this graphic is it looks like the manhole is floating in space, which is not, there is rock under that. And the next graphic I'll show you better illustrates that. Um, but that bottom 10 feet is a slotted well screen, um, to be able to release that water into the, the washed rock layer. <clears throat> so obviously the number of dry wells is going to vary, um, depending on obviously your location, the modeling and, and your site conditions you know, what that infiltration rate is, um, if you're using WWHM, like we mentioned, or if you're in Oregon using HydroCAD and modeling that way. 
but um, but this is a, uh, a technology that allows you to go quite a bit deeper. Um, this is the Maxwell Plus, which basically incorporates what most of you would probably call a said manhole upstream. Um, so on the left-hand side, the water's entering and it again has to spend some time settling in that manhole. And then there's a slotted well screen um, to a crossover pipe that then directs it to the Maxwell uh, where it again has to spend some time, uh, some torturous time in that manhole section before it can go down into uh, the clean wash rock layer. So being able to incorporate pre-settling upstream really helps with the longevity of these systems. Maintenance, right? Always the question. You can't drill a dry well that's 100 feet deep and expect to be able to maintain 100 feet deep, right? You, you, that's not feasible with a vac truck. So that's really the, the key of the Maxwell is having that upper 15 feet that is that solid manhole section and being able to vac out that section. Um, so, you know, you can see in that upper picture, if you're at say a, a mini mart type of location with a lot of cans and bottles and things, it really traps all that as well as trapping sediment um, and debris so that it doesn't get down into that clean washed rock layer where you wanna protect those void spaces and you know, keep this drywall working for a really long time. Um, the maintenance cycle varies. Two to three years is what we see, but it, it clearly depends on the loading from the site, right? A residential subdivision is gonna have different loading than you know, a, a highly trafficked uh, commercial site. So you wanna take that into consideration. We definitely recommend once a year inspections so that you can get an idea of what that maintenance frequency is going to be. And then using a vac truck to remove um, those materials. <clears throat> okay. Another thing that's unique about the Maxwell is being able to target where you want to infiltrate. Um, what we do here is, is vary the slurry depth to really target infiltration rates or target infiltration um, zone. We recently installed a project in the city of Portland with 25 feet of contaminated soil. And under that contaminated soil was great Missoula flood deposits and, and deep groundwater. Um, so what we did there is we drilled through the contaminated soil, um, installed a casing and a bentonite plug, and then drilled within the casing down into those native soils. We weren't pulling any of that contamination down, um, down to our final depth, right? and installed the Maxwell there. And we installed slurry um, you know, past that contamination zone so that we were just targeting infiltration in that lower zone where, you know, where we wanted to have water going into it. Uh, this is also applicable if you're next to a foundation where obviously you don't wanna infiltrate within a zone of influence there. So being able to target where that slurry depth is so you really are, are infiltrating where you want to be adding water um, is a nice feature of the Maxwell to be able to, to do that. Okay, let's talk about how these are installed. Um, typically we mobilize after rough grading and you'll see the drill rig there with the auger. Um, it typically takes us two to three days to complete a dry well. And you know, ideally we do come in kind of at the beginning of the site um, to be able to install these. The first thing we do is use a four foot diameter auger to install that um, drill hole all the way down to the final depth, whether that final depth is 30 feet, 50 feet, 90 feet. Uh, we're gonna go down with a four foot auger to that final depth there. Uh, and then we'll come back either with a reaming knife, which is shown on the left there, or a six foot diameter auger and create that upper portion that is where we're gonna see that pre-settling manhole um, be placed. Next step, installing geotextile fabric. We install that inside our borehole um, to make sure that we're not seeing that fines migration um, from the existing soils into our clean washed rock layer that we want to be you know, specifically for, for infiltrating. And then we're building those internal components. So you can see there's a cap that we install on a length of corrugated plastic pipe and then in the upper right picture, you can see the 10 foot of slotted well screen that's at the bottom. So we lower that in with a cap to the elevation that it needs to be at. Um, and then we can add the clean washed rock layer. So 
So every kind of scoop that we're adding there brings that elevation up about a foot and a half. And we bring rock up to about four feet past the uh, transition from the four foot to the six foot diameter borehole. And then we place our liner sections. Um, these can be, depending on the location and the site, these can be um, perforated at the bottom or they can be solid all the way. Um, so we'll set those manhole sections. We'll set a cone on top um, to reduce that from a 48 inch down to a 30 inch for our casting. And then we'll install the casting, whether that's a great or a solid cover um, and add some more washed rock typically about um, up to about four feet below finish grade. We also install all the crossover pipes. So whether that's between a Maxwell Plus that has that pre-settling component and the Maxwell, that crossover pipe, or a project that has multiple Maxwells daisy chained together, we'll install all those crossover pipes um, to make sure that the full system is complete. We patch and seal everything to make sure we have a really professional finished product. You can see um, that center picture there is the well screen within um, that settling chamber in the, um, in the Maxwell Plus before it's directed with a pipe to the actual Maxwell drywall. <clears throat> and then here is the internal components housed you know, within the Maxwell itself. So you can see that stand pipe there you can see the screen and the floatables baffle. And then the picture on the far right is kind of the finished product, right? If you're looking down from the ladder, you can see the, the hydrocarbon pillow there on the floor and you can see the stand pipe and that um, floatables baffle there. And then we backfill with two sack slurry to grade. We think this is really important to prevent subsidence and just lock everything in place um, as opposed to using you know, existing material from the site. Um, if it does have a graded top, we always put a geotextile fabric on top of it. And um, this really is important. I mean, just beyond the geotextile fabric, whenever you're installing a drywall, protecting it during construction is really critical, right? Uh, we've all been on job sites where there's like a chocolate milk river coming and you're like, no, don't go to the drywall, right? So, um, you know, construction runoff is, is known to have really high um, very small particulates that really turbid water. Um, and we just don't want that entering the dry well before the site is stabilized. So it's really important to protect these, um, keep them offline until the site is stabilized and really ready for that post-construction runoff to enter it. Um, we also perk test the dry wells after the, they are installed. Uh, we think this is really important to get you some actual data of how these are performing. We do a constant head test where we bring up the water within that upper 15 foot um, settling chamber and we dial the flow to maintain a constant uh, water level so that we can accurately you know, look at what that infiltration rate is going to be. Um, and oftentimes, you know, because what we talked about with head, right, because these are typically deeper than your standard 20 or 30 foot deep dry well, um, you get to take advantage of that head component when you're looking at that infiltration data. Um, so my, my plug for geotech here is, um, you know, if you can hire a geotech in that early stage of your design and have them do deeper borings, it just gives you another tool um, to look at, right? If they only do borings at 10 feet deep, you will not know if this is even a possibility on your site. So being able to have that data early on really gives you just more options to look at to see if, if something like a deep infiltration system is, is a good solution, right? Um, so plug for the geotechs. Um, okay, let's talk about some case studies. This was a project in Portland that we installed at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Um, this church wanted to do some building expansion and projects and the city of Portland was like, that is well and good once you, uh, you know, take care of that parking lot of yours that's super old and outdated and doesn't meet any of our stormwater requirements or landscaping requirements. So they were like, okay, yep, that's our next project. Um, so they had a parking lot that held about 99 cars and ultimately, you know, the goal was keep as many parking spaces as possible, right? Um, and still meet city of Portland's requirements. And so 
deep infiltration, they're on the, the northeast side of the city. Um, deep infiltration, you know, began to, to be talked about and they did some borings and discovered, hey, we're going to hit some great deposits here. This, um, this is a good solution. This will save us a lot of space and be able to, um, you know, get that water into the ground. So here is, you know, just, you can see the, the truck arriving with some liner and pipe material. That bottom picture shows you, you know, once it's finished, all you see is the, the manhole covers on top, right? So um, really minimal footprint. They did have a biofiltration um, design as well, treating some of the stormwater uh, before it went to the dry wells. And then in that middle picture, you can see the perk test starting. <clears throat> okay, let's see if this works here. Um, so this is boring, right? Um, doing the boring first. And what we found is, um, I know these are really small, uh, just looking at these, uh, the well logs there, but um, what they hit was that SP and SW soils, um, sands, right? They hit sand layers, which was great for infiltration. And the design perk rate on this project was 17 GPM. And when we did the perk testing, our perk tests were 206 GPM. Um, so even with you know the factors of safety that are necessary, we were still well, well above uh, what was required. Another recent installation we did was at the Anaman Affordable Housing Project. Uh, this was originally designed with 10 30-foot deep dry wells, and we were able to propose using five 50-foot deep dry wells. Um, and you know, basically save them all that area of, of intrusive construction work. Um, also being able to target the installation with drill as opposed to excavating a large area was helpful on this tight site. Um, so those are some of the, the things that can, you know, other possibilities in the design world when you can look at going deeper. Um, these are hard to see. I wish in a smaller group, I would pass around these bottles, right? So you could take a look at this. But it was really interesting to be there during the drilling because uh, when they went through that first 17 feet on this particular project, we used a, a bucket rig, which um, is one that has basically kind of solid sides and then an opening at the bottom. And so you pull it out and then empty the bucket, right? And in that first 17 feet, it was like, right? As it was coming out, because it was so, it was just like this clay layer. And then there was this transition layer, right? Between the clay and the sand. Um, right at 17 feet. And then it was like, we were at the beach, right? Everything we pulled out was just like beautiful beach sand. Um, so it really is interesting if you can get beyond that upper confining layer um, and get into these deposits, um, you know, what you can find. It was, it's fun to be on site and watch that. Okay, this was a project we installed in the city of Gresham. Um, so the city of Gresham is located just east of Portland. And they are, let's see, their MS4 watershed is about 15,000 acres, to give you some perspective. Um, and they are growing like a lot of Northwest cities, right? And their MS4 is near capacity. And so they were looking for solutions. How do we alleviate some of the strain on our MS4? Um, and they hired a company called GSI, uh, a geotechnical firm, to do borings around the city uh, to see if deep infiltration was a possibility. And so they, you know, GSI first looked at groundwater depths. Um, that's, you know, a critical factor when you're looking at this. Gresham has some great Missoula flood deposits, but they also have a perched groundwater layer um, because of a confining layer upper in the upper um, portion. And so you've got to get beyond that confining layer before you can get into the Troutdale formation and, and some of those really great deposits. What they found was that on the east side of the city, groundwater depth was 20 to 30 feet deep. But on the west side of the city, groundwater depth was 80 to 90 feet deep. And that meant almost 50 feet of unsaturated zone um, that was perfect for deep infiltration. They also looked at water well locations, right? We wanna be outside of 500 feet from a water well, outside of the two year time of travel. So that was critical. Um, and they looked at the hydraulic conductivity of the soil to find the best location. Um, Another just side note is when they were looking at sites to do these borings and, and discover um, you know, the place to install this, they looked at uh, residential, right? Because residential has the least likelihood for a spill. 
And you, you know, this is not a great area to put one in, say, an industrial site that has a higher likelihood of a spill. So they targeted residential areas um, as a place to put this. Making sure that we're protecting groundwater and drinking water is critical, right? So the more space you have between the bottom of your dry well and the groundwater elevation, the more treatment you have. And, you know, just again, keeping it in a residential area is ideal from that perspective as well. Um, okay, so then this is just a portion, a snippet from the plans of what went out from the city of um, Gresham's plans showing the, the Maxwell option. And in, you know, within um, this particular site that GSI identified was gonna be a good location, they did have that perch groundwater layer about five feet below finished grade. So they did some dewatering on the site before construction. And then we also installed, we drilled down 10 feet and installed a casing um, slurried around that so that we didn't have any of that perch groundwater coming in onto our auger flights as we were uh, removing material. So then we were able to drill within that casing down to the final depth. <clears throat> You'll also notice on here, I wish I had my pointer, but um, you've got a, a two inch pipe that is um, kind of unique in this particular application. And I do uh, highly suggest that on city projects where you wanna do additional monitoring in the long-term, right? Because that allows you to put a pressure transducer down and do infiltration testing um, you know, for the life of this system and see how it's doing. Another very unique thing about this particular site was um, this was right in the middle of a residential street, right? And obviously there's existing utilities, right? So um, there was a gas line on one side and a 24 inch storm main on the other side, you can see there in red and green, and they were about 10 feet apart. Um, so not a great application for an excavator to come uh, install a dry well, but a great application for a surgically drilled dry well, right? right in between those utilities. What we did find when we actually went to install this is that that gas line had been abandoned, but we didn't know that when we were doing our design work. Um, and, and this ended up you know, still being a great location because we could go right in between those utilities. This also had an impact of you know, not having such a large excavation area that would have increased road closure times and also you know, reducing those long pipe runs. Um, in Washington, this is an example of a project we installed in Kirkland. Um, this was a women's shelter where we built two 50 foot deep Maxwells. You know, we talked about ecology's requirements for treatment upstream, and this did require enhanced treatment. So they were using the biopod upstream of that to meet enhanced treatment requirements. This also had some underground detention um, and then two Maxwells. And the design perk rate on this was 0.15 CFS and the actual perk rate was 0.5. So again, a, a much, um, a huge advantage there of once we had these installed. Okay, so in summary, you've made it. This is quiz time. No. Um, in summary, you know, being able to help with flood control, um, being able to, you know, hopefully eliminate strain on some of the MS4 systems when these are installed in, in public areas where they can be retrofitted, um, reducing those long pipe runs, hopefully reducing CSO events. And then with dry wells specifically like the Maxwell, being able to bypass that upper confining layer and get into those really great soils below um, is a huge advantage with a small footprint, simple retrofit, and also maintainable. Okay, back to uh, my Yellowstone uh, story here. So my children do not fully comprehend what all of us in this room are here for, right? Protecting this precious water resource. But ultimately I'm trying to find creative ways to expose them to water. And geysers are pretty cool. I, I thought that was a fun way. So they can start to appreciate um, this amazing resource, right? There is a vast array of tools you have in your toolbox. Um, you know, to help manage water. And I think that deep infiltration is one of those tools to be used in the right project um, to help us meet those goals. So thank you so much. Um, I will take questions. Uh, I saw your hand first.
uh, infiltrate, or procreate was a lot less than actual. You had opposite happen where your actual procreate was more, or excuse me, less than your design to where potentially overflowing that fan hole could occur. Yeah, I mean, every site is unique, right? And that is what's so amazing about, you know, my, my expertise level lies mostly in Western Oregon and Washington, but <clears throat> the geology varies considerably, right? Even within the same site, as we know. Um, it's really important if you attended uh, Scott Kindred's talk earlier, you know, to, to have multiple spots on your site where you're testing so that you can accurately predict what you're gonna find. Um, but yes, I mean, there's definitely been some sites we've installed where we didn't reach the, the perk rates that we thought we would reach. The uh, boring, you know, that they did was, far enough away that it wasn't accurate of, of what we actually um, installed, right? So, so that can be the case as well. I would say more on the side of outperforming than underperforming, but yes, I mean, we've definitely had sites where, where you know, it hasn't measured up to what we thought for sure. Yeah. The normal boring spit that you have, how Yeah, are you from City of Bend? Redmond. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we are actually working with city of Bend right now on a pilot project um, where we're going through uh, a tough layer and fractured basalt. Um, it's kind of a new thing for us. We do um, some, what we call hard drilling in Arizona through Caliche, but we have not done um, a lot of drilling through hard rock like basalt. So this pilot project, we're really looking forward to working with Bend and and seeing how this works and, and what equipment we need to learn from to we're actually working um, in conjunction with a local drilling company that has more expertise in drilling through basalt than we do uh, to learn and, and figure out what, what's the best approach there. So yes, we are hoping to do more work in Redmond Bend area, but we need to uh, you know learn first and make sure that, that we've got the right equipment to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, some of these are installed with overflows, some of them are not. I mean, it depends on, you know, what design storm, if we're designing for, say, the 25 year and they have an overflow path that is approved, or if we're designing for the 100 year. Um, so it does just depend on the site. We can install an overflow pipe, or it can be uh, a design where it is designed to, you know, have another path during, um, during those type of events that would direct the water elsewhere. Yeah. I'm going to go back to my just if anyone wants to write down my contact info. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we install a lot of these in Southern California um, and we have run into some sites that have such, um, such, such sandy material that doesn't, that's prone to caving, uh, that it creates what I like to call kind of a thermometer bulb effect at the bottom. So there's been cases where we haven't reached the depth that we thought we would reach, say, you know, a project that was supposed to go 60 feet deep, and maybe we only end up going to 40 feet before we start to see that thermometer bulb. What we found though is, is when we do reach those type of caving conditions like that, that when we do the perk test on that system, that's when you're reaching those soils that can take an enormous amount of water. And so typically when we do the perk test, we are far exceeding what is required and we don't have to drill deeper. Um, but yes, that is a consideration. We have had projects where we've um, needed to case more of it to prevent, um, you know, caving of the hole. This will be our last question. We have one minute. Um, what's the, the thinking as far as like what happens at the yeah sure i mean there is always a risk right with any dry wells um we have looked at in in the maxwell plus that has that additional additional pre-settling area putting an oil control spill valve in there on the outlet so if there was a spill um, you would be able to trap that within that pre-settling manhole and it wouldn't go to the Maxwell. So that's an option if you are in an, in an area where a spill is, is you know, a, a more likely event. Um, let's see, 
trying to remember all of your question there. Um, it, in terms of, it, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for reminding me. Um, so it, when it gets to the end of life there, um, you do need to abandon it and you do need to, you know, use another, put in a, a Maxwell or another drywall um, right next to it and connect it and use that system as a, as a pretreatment system, if you will. Um, but I will say that the Torrent has some of these that have been installed for 50 years and we're still seeing them in operation. Um, so there is that. Okay, time's up. If anyone has extra questions, I would love to chat with you afterwards. Um, so thank you so much.